Good day, friends. Welcome to the traditional pre-cost tube event 20 some odd questions episode. We're getting geared up for the cost tube symposium on August 19th through 22nd, and this is just a nice way to get to know some of the folks participating. This year we're doing 21 questions in 2021. I'll put links to all the relative good stuff down in the description for your convenience. If I remember. Two things. All four members of my immediate family, not including the husband, parents, sibling, self, went to art college, so the creative energy in our family dynamic expressed itself in a lot of crafty ways. This means the bar is high in our family for Halloween costumes. My early costumes included Wonder Woman and the Blue Fairy, complete with cardboard wings that were professionally marker shaded. I hate to think of the contact high Dad probably got off the marker fumes, because I have it on good authority that it was entirely too possible to get stoned off your art in those days. When my sibling was a Ghostbuster in 1984, Dad sketched out all the patches and I painted them, and Mum made them a jumpsuit and wired up a proton pack from a backpack with a simple electrical circuit. Did I mention that mum is a ham operator? She was licensed back in the day when you actually needed to be fluent in Morse code and certified for electrical wiring. You never know how transferable a skill is until your kid needs a proton pack in a week and all you have is some wire, a few lights, an old backpack, and some vacuum cleaner parts. My sibling is no slouch when it comes to the costuming gig either. Being a sculptor comes in handy when your kid wants their very own daft punk helmet or your family decide to do Halloween as the entire primary cast of Rogue One, including the snarky robot. The second thing that got me into costuming was a love of history. I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a kid, but I got talked out of it by folks who correctly assumed that I wouldn't want to spend my life digging trenches in various bits of dirt. I can't be arsed to take care of my own garden, let alone dig up someone else's looking for bones and pottery. In retrospect, I probably should have taken anthropology and specialized in dress and textiles, because my two years at the Ontario College of Art and Design now rebranded OCAD University, is only now becoming even slightly relevant to my future career hopes and dreams. I think I've watched every bootleg episode of Time Team though, if that counts. I just want to do it all. I want to explore pretty much every nook and cranny of dress history and then take a sharp turn around the edge of cosplay into stuff derived from fiction. Whether that's movies, TV, or comics and novels, I want to history bound and make my own daily wear clothes and blur the lines between fantasy and reality with wardrobe. I want to be that house in the neighborhood where the kids want to trick or treat because the owners really get into the spirit of the thing. And to top it all off, I want to drag crafting into it because it generally goes hand in hand with costuming. It takes a lot longer, yes, but there's something really thrilling about finding an obscure knit scarf or Spencer pattern or crocheted lace that hasn't been in circulation for over a hundred years. When I have the cash to do so, I'd like to talk with non-European makers about filming demonstrations so they can show off their traditional crafts as well. My family learned a lot about Indigenous art and crafts when we lived in the Northwest Territories, and I'd love to have the opportunity to share that information with you, taught by people who know it best. That's a future project, though, because I'd want to reimburse those makers fairly for their time and labor. My parents, my grandparents, particularly my paternal grandmother, and various kind people on the internet who have, at various times, written blog posts or made videos describing garments or stitches or just entertained me with their sewing and craft foibles. Like most other costume viewers, I've devoured episodes by Bernadette Banner, Morgan Donner, Rachel Maxey, and Makara Tours. I've also enjoyed Kayla of McNerdy Costumes and Props, Muse and Dionysus, Sostein, Engineering Knits, Miranda Milner, Rebecca of Pocket Full of Posies, and The Stephanies, Stephanie Canada and Stephanie of What's Sewing On. 
This is just the tip of the iceberg. You can find more costumers in the wild on Instagram, and if you check out the Costube Entertainment Network Instagram account, you'll find a lot of new up-and-comers. Sometimes I learn something from these folks. Most times I'm just entertained while I'm learning other things at my own pace. Polworth Silk. Sorry, that's spinning fiber. I had a fiber subscription at one point and I got Polworth Silk in the mail one month and that stuff was just... I don't have any favorites yet. I'm a scrounger. I use what I can find and afford and what kind of looks nice. Someday I'll limit myself to preferences. For now, I'm just experimenting, you know? So far, my Shetland wool scarf from an 1870s pattern. I call it a knitting mystery because it kinda is. I found it in a text-only book printed somewhere in Scotland by a company that seems to have specialized mostly in religious and related stories. The purpose of the book seems to be one of keeping your hands from being idle so that you can make things for those less fortunate, but with an extra large dose of condescension. Never been much of a fan of condescension. I'm a sarcasm kind of girl. Anyhow. They didn't mention the author, just that it was a lady, which could be anybody. But a couple of big name knitters at the time had started using abbreviations that were mostly specific to their particular patterns and pattern books. So it's very likely the publishers of the book pinched a pack of purloined patterns from one of these authors. Scandalous, is it not? And here you thought knitting was just some boring old hobby done by little old ladies who had a strange doily fetish. I plan to drop another crafting mystery for Cozy. I have the materials, I just need to cast on. Quite possibly my Edwardian chemise. It was the start of my hubris smacking face first into my nemesis, with somewhat comic results. I thought I'd have the project finished in a couple of hours, Oh boy, was I wrong. And while my salt was truly palpable in that video, I learned a lot. And I'm a lot more comfortable with Truly Victorian's directions and construction style. I've honestly gotten my money's worth out of TVE02 Edwardian underwear. More if you count the accidental comedy. Commercial patterns thus far with an eye to learning pattern drafting. I have mad respect for the closet historian and her ability to make pretty much any outfit she likes from self-drafted blocks. So that's on my to-do list because I don't want to rely on those few pattern makers who are kind enough to include my size. I have whole rants on this subject. Suffice to say, I keep taking pot shots at the super big pattern industry, the McCalls and Vogues of this world, because there is a significant portion of sewists who don't realize they can buy patterns online. To give the big pattern companies their due, there are some new sizes coming out, but it's happening very slowly, as if to test the waters before committing. They're still putting smaller sized models in the sample pictures and sticking to really basic, really shapeless designs designs were possible, so there's hope, but I'd rather be able to draft my own clothing rather than rely on some faceless corporation that barely considers me part of the demographic, let alone a human being that should be stylishly clothed. It depends on the pattern. If it's a commercial printed pattern or I don't have a backup, trace because if you go down or up a size, you may be disappointed if you've lost the extra sizing information. Same if I'm going to alter a pattern in a destructive manner for pretty much the same reasons. If it's a digital pattern that I can print off at my leisure, chop that baby up, because you can always print another one off if you mess up. Yes, it could be a waste of paper if you do it too often, but the objective is to get to a point where you won't need to print all those new copies. But if I go from a torrid size 3 to a standard size 18, and the pattern includes those sizes, I'd like to have the option to just print and recut. Yes. People have already seen my super bougie pattern weights. If I really need something to stay put, I use pins. 
I've also used those little grabby things that I think quilters use, the thing that's a cross between an alligator clip and a binder clip. Those can be really handy on occasion. Way too many. My sibling-in-law sent me some tatting tools and I'm just trying to find the time to do more than watch a couple of videos and make a couple of loops here and there. I'd also like to learn pattern matching and weaving and someday when I have more disposable cash I'd like to get a sock knitting machine and a small loom. And I'd like to try my hand at embroidery. It could be worse. I think that by my age, my mom was learning how to do fancy wicker caned chairs. I haven't yet hit the point where I'm sneaking that particular bin of supplies out of her basement. I keep hearing that linen is the cat's arse, but that stuff's expensive. It also comes in different weights, so I'd like to get my hands on some and maybe make some shirts for the husband and shirts and dresses for myself. Possibly chainmail, but also possibly foam pumpkins. Chainmail is something I've tinkered with and would love to do more of, but it takes forever and is hard on the hands. It's also heavy. You don't think it's heavy, but you get enough of those little rings and it doesn't matter. Foam pumpkins are a seasonal thing and while the foam itself isn't exactly eco-friendly, the pumpkin can be reused on a yearly basis. So if you have a jack-o'-lantern pattern that's getting a little worn out or it's hard on the hands to carve year after year, a couple of foam pumpkins and a hot wire or knife might just be the way to go. It also makes a great gift for a senior citizen who wants to let trick-or-treaters know that they're giving out candy, but that no longer has the manual dexterity to carve their own. I'm learning to enjoy hand sewing. I mean, before I took up machine sewing and knitting, I was heavily into cross stitch, but there's just something about whip stitching down a felled seam or completing a hem that's strangely satisfying. I don't pretend to understand it. The grey tabby who often graces my videos is named Mischief. We took her in when a friend adopted a stray that had kittens. Missy was one of the kittens. We've had her for nearly 18 years now, I think, and she's definitely a character. She's also the reason why you rarely see my floors. Geriatric cats do bad things to carpet, and there are only so many times per year you want to get out steam cleaner, particularly in a heat wave when you can't open the windows because of the smoke from forest fires. Never gets old. For those who weren't in on the joke, it's a grommet press. It kind of took on a life of its own amongst my viewers when I was making the lacing strips for my corsets. I bought it somewhere in the early 2000s when I was making underbust corsets for myself and it's come in really handy since. Whew. Mm. Too many to mention. I sew over thick folds of fabric, busting machine needles. I sew over pins. I reuse fabric that probably should have been retired three seam attempts ago. I seam rip with wild abandon and little control. I am not a good sewist, but I have fun. Boop the like button if any of this speaks to you, because I'm sure I'm not the only person who accidentally ripped a hole in a piece of silk dupioni that can't easily be replaced because they bought it 18 years prior. Yes. It, it really depends. Mum and I found some lovely suiting for my eventual walking skirt and I picked up some cotton to line it with. However, I've since found a bunch of wool blends that I think I'd prefer and I'm trying to justify the expense of investing in the five or so meters plus matching lining. 
I may wind up with multiple skirts, which is probably not a bad thing, but definitely not as planned. I also haven't picked up the fabric for the blouse to go with the skirt, but I do have fabric for Regency corset and chemise stashed away. And then there's just the bins of novelty cotton prints and the things I scavenged from Mum's stash and some old curtains and bed skirts that found their way into our house but never get used for their intended purpose. And I haven't even mentioned the bins of yarn and fiber for knitting, spinning, and crochet. I'm just a crafting hoarder. Slippers for the sewing machine because I wear slippers in my home. Socks and a clean microfiber cloth when I'm treadling my spinning wheel because I don't want to get the foot treadle dirty. I think that was the shortest question to answer right there. Tea for every day. Tetley rounds to be precise. I have far too much flavored tea that has somehow weaseled its way into my home and hasn't found a use due to my own lack of elegance and taste. I enjoy hot chocolate on occasion, usually in winter. I gussy up my carnation instant hot chocolate with a dollop of heavy cream, a dash of cinnamon, and a hearty glug of Irish cream. Tasty. Mostly other YouTube channels. Outside of the costume sphere, I like silly stuff like Simply Nail Logical, Kelly Marissa, and Nail Career Education, Tasting History with Max Miller, How to Drink, The Babish Universe, and I really do enjoy watching YouTube growth and education channels like Catherine Manning, Annie Dubay, and Channel Makers. I've been considering starting a second channel of my own in this niche just to talk about the things that I've learned about YouTube from costuming. So if that's something you're interested in watching, let me know in the comments comments because while I have a lot of crafty hobbies, the business of YouTube, filming video, making thumbnails, and learning how to do silly things like light a room with the worst color of paint on the walls is a hobby in and of itself. I'm a cord cutter so I don't really watch TV unless it's on Netflix or Prime. I have a bunch of comfort movies that I watch over and over like a manic six-year-old. War Games with Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy, Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox, Footloose and Tremors with Kevin Bacon, Ghostbusters, the original 1984 release. As I said, comfort movies. They're familiar and they're fun and I can enjoy them even while I'm making a scene. I love making historical garments, but I'd like to untether myself from only making these items. Also, logically speaking, from locking myself into one period of history for long stretches of time, if you know what I mean. I'd like to insert a little more whimsy and work on a few skills other than just sewing the next garment in an outfit while still being watchable. I have a couple of ideas for the autumn that I hope to get done and aren't necessarily costume related, but I'm also thinking towards fall and wardrobes now that summer fatigue has truly set in. And that's my 21 questions. Hope to see you at Cozy. Till then.